talking about your, uh, growing up in New York and how I was playing basketball. Well, I growing up in New York, uh, you know, I was a street kid, and uh, we played uh, all types of sports, handball, uh, punch ball, stick ball, stoop ball, box ball, you name it. And uh, I was a, a big Dodger fan. Uh, I used Dodgers to go fan. to Ebbets. Yes. Yeah. My role model was Jackie Robinson. And uh, I used to go to Ebbets Field a lot because, you know, we could sit in the bleacher seats. They they were very inexpensive at the time. Okay. And and so uh, the great opportunity was that uh, I got to meet Jackie Robinson. And um, I was so impressed because, you know, he was, he was a, a great human being. I mean, he was a guy that... Uh, uh, he uh, played uh, with fierceness. He played with intelligence. Uh, he was a team player, and uh, you are not going to intimidate him. So uh, those were qualities that I admired in him. And uh, so he was a huge role model for me. Um my dad died when I was five years old, so my mother was a big influence, and in, and also the priest in my parish, uh, a guy named uh, Father Tom Mannion. Uh, what parish did you so, grow up in, in New York? Uh, Holy Rosary, which okay. was in Bed Stuyvesant. Okay, and um, I I read that your mother is um, of Irish American descent and. Father's African American, so that's right. Cre- mm-hmm. The Creole in a sense. So I was just wondering, um, how was that like growing up uh, in an interracial household? Well, uh, you know, uh, I didn't know my dad well because he died yeah. when I was five, but uh, I knew his uh, his family. His he had three sisters, and they were wonderful to us. You know, they. Uh, uh, when, when you grow up in Brooklyn, it was a very mixed neighborhood, and uh, the one thing everybody had in common was we didn't have any money. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't experience a lot of prejudice as a kid. You know, I, I began to realize that as I got older, and... uh you know, when I went away to college, there were, I mean, because, you know, reading the newspapers and stuff, uh, you saw what was going on in other places. And um, and when I went to Providence College, there was only f- uh, about six of us in the whole school, six uh, minorities. Yeah, probably. So, um, growing up Catholic, how do you think that, like, uh, uh, childhood in, in Brooklyn? Well, uh, it was, uh, you know, there was, uh, I grew up around Catholics. My father's people were Baptists. Uh, so I saw all sides. I, I had friends who were Presbyterian. So, you know, it, that didn't affect us uh, one way or the other. We respected each other. And, and you know, as a youngster, I was always told that respect was a two-way street. And if you wanted it, you had to give it. So, I know you went to boys' high school. I mean, you went to boys. It was all boys, wasn't it? Yes, it was all boys. Mm-hmm. Okay. Can you uh, talk about um, the experience? I mean, was your elementary school uh, same sex or was it co ed? No, the elementary school I went to was Holy Rosary. Okay. And yeah, so, yeah. what are you saying? Uh, no, no, Holy Rosary was very, it was mixed. You know, I mean, there were black kids, white kids, you know, a couple of Asian kids. Okay. So, uh, going to boys' high school, um, how was the adjustment from going to, like, um, a co-ed education to the same sex? 
Well, elementary school was co-ed, and 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 once I got to high school, it was all male. But that didn't affect us. I mean, I, uh, you know, it, uh, it it just was the way it was. You know, I mean, we uh, listen. Growing up in my neighborhood, there were enough a lot of parties that we went to. So uh, our social setting, the the gatherings were always good. Yeah. So, uh, did you have friends from your grade school that went to boys' high school as well, or are you like only like one of the few people in your neighborhood? No, no, a couple of guys in, in a couple of guys in my neighborhood went there. Uh, a guy named Tommy Davis, who turned out to be a great baseball player. Uh, he he went to boys' high. Uh, so did a guy who lived around the corner from me by the name of Vinnie Cohen, who was a great athlete. So, that, I mean, it was kids from the neighborhood went, you know, to there. So we knew each other. Okay. So did you, did you, um, did you varsity at, um, at a boy in multiple sports or did you just strictly play basketball? Well, um, I was, um, I started going basketball. to the play. I started going to the playgrounds more and more and uh, started to get into basketball. And so uh, Tommy Davis played baseball, basketball. He was a great athlete, and he was on uh, boys high. Uh, you know, he he was a varsity player, and uh, he could play both sports. But I uh, once I got into basketball, I started to lose my interest in playing baseball, not in watching because I still love the game, but in uh, participating, uh, I started to go to the playgrounds, and as my success, as I started to improve as a player, uh, my interest grew. Um, I went out for the boys' high basketball team my freshman year, and they had uh, 15 guys on the team. I was number 15. And, uh, you know, he only played about eight guys most of the game. So I dropped off the team because I had to, uh, I had a little job and to help out the family. So, uh, you know, I started going to the playgrounds more and more. And finally, uh, my senior year in high school, Tommy talked me into coming back out for the team, Tommy Davis. And I went back out for it and made their starting five. Okay. So, um, do you still keep in contact with Tommy Davis and um, Vincent Corleone? Vinny Vinny Cohen. Vinny passed away. Uh, But but Tommy, I still talk to Tommy. In fact, I just talked to him yesterday. Mm Mm-hmm. So, uh, can you speak on the recruiting process of uh, like Providence to do and like or can you just talk about the senior season? Uh, boy time? Well, my uh you know, my senior I graduated mid year from Boys High, uh, like in the January. And so uh when they went to the PSAL championships, uh I couldn't play. I was just watching. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, um, a, the coach from uh, Providence College came down to watch the what was called the PSAL Championships, Public School Athletic League Championships, and and of course Tommy was playing, so I went to I watched it, and uh, the coach from Providence talked to me because. Uh, the uh, priest from my parish wrote to the, to uh, their athletic department uh, telling them that they should take a look at me. So to make a long story short, uh, uh, I uh, they used to have these workouts, uh, and I went out to one of the workouts that Providence College had uh, out on Long Island at Chaminade High School. And... Um, there was a ton of people out there. I don't know what they could have seen in me, but eventually I received a scholarship from Providence College. 
So I mean, receiving that like the, the scholarship was um really like the only like one of the few teams that like were um, recruiting you. Like I mean, cause it, you got St. John's University in New York. You also got Florida. Like that wasn't well. St. John's was it wasn't far from where I lived at the time, but uh, they. Uh, they, you know, I'm sure they recruit. They recruited a lot of people. I wasn't one of them, but um, I got to know St. John's because when I was at Providence, we played them at Madison Square Garden. Because they have some uh, rivalry because they're both Catholic universities in the East. Yeah, well, they were both. Uh, you know, I mean. Providence played a lot of schools. Uh, we played St. Bonaventure's. You know, we played uh, a lot of schools in New England. You know, Holy Cross, uh, and uh, even we even played Bradley University, which was in Peoria, uh, Illinois. We played St. Louis University, which was Catholic. You know, but we played a lot of schools. Right, um, can you talk about like? Um, can, is it, they're not a girls' high school, is it? I know the two schools, you know, they emerged to it now. Well, I was graduated before boys yeah, in yeah. high, boys high and girls high became one school. I had, or I was long gone. All right, so it was a girls high. There was a girls high, but it was just a, a separate school. It was uh, just a school for females. All right, so was that somewhat like a sister school in a sense? Yeah. Yeah, it was like a sister school. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and do did they, did they, did they have a women's sports at that time? Uh, hold on a second. Uh, I couldn't hear you. I let my wife pick that phone up. It's ringing. I'm in my office. Uh-huh. Okay, go ahead. Mm-hmm. What would you say? I was saying, did um, the girls hide? They, like, did they have women's sports at that time? Did they have a women's basketball team? Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember. I didn't pay much attention to it at that time. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, uh, can you talk about uh, your experience at Providence and, like, uh, like some of the rivalries that you guys had in basketball? Well, uh, Providence, uh, you know, uh, I thought it was a great school. Um, they... Uh, uh, the academics was outstanding, and at that time, uh, there were very few lay teachers. There, a lot of most of the teachers were Dominican fathers, right. Dominican priests. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, but uh, rivalries were always uh, certainly Brown University was a, a rivalry because it was in the same city, of Providence, and uh, you know. Um, University of Rhode Island was a, a rivalry. Uh, you know, uh, Springfield College was a rivalry. Um, those were schools we saw a lot because they were in our area. You know, Holy Cross, uh, Boston University, you know, University of Massachusetts. I mean, uh, so yeah, I mean, I know I know you're a two-time All-American, but uh, I was wondering how many how many years did you go to Providence? Uh, four years. Uh, you know, we had to. Uh, yeah, as a freshman, you had to play freshman ball back then, and so uh, our freshman team, we had a very good team. In fact, uh, we were undefeated. We were twenty-three and all. Okay, so, so what about sophomore year? So like, were there any uh, championships with freshmen? I'm assuming there was. Like, like, who did you guys play? Well, uh, we were, like, considered the, the top school in New England at the time. But uh, we went to uh, NIT in my uh, uh, junior year. And uh, we didn't win it. We were runner-up. Uh, my senior year... We lost in the finals. Uh, we played Bradley University, and they won. And then the uh, year after I graduated, uh, Providence won the NIT, which at that time 
that was the big tournament in New York. Everybody wanted to take part in the NIT. And you said it was your freshman year? No, no. My no. My freshman year, uh yeah. you had to play freshman ball. You didn't you couldn't yeah. play on the varsity. Yeah. And sophomore and, year. We were under sophomore I went to the I, I played on the varsity. Sophomore, junior and senior. Um, so kind of you were all American your last two years. Was like your sophomore yeah. year is just like kind of like a utility player or like, or like no, I was a starter. I became a starter. You know, I was a starter. But uh, and we had a decent team. We just didn't, uh, you know, we didn't have the recognition that a lot of other schools had because Providence was a small school. And uh, but junior year and senior year, we played in the NIT, which was the big tournament at the time. Okay, I'm looking. I'm looking at the. Um... The junior year, I see that Bradley was pretty good. Uh, yes. Oklahoma City, St. Bonaventure, St. Louis. Um, can you talk about some of those like teams you played? And, uh, so, like, well, Bradley players. was. Well, Chet Walker, who played in the NBA, uh, played for Bradley, uh, and uh, Bradley uh, beat us in the in the finals in the NIT. It was a close game. But it, uh, it, I got the the MVP of the tournament. Is this, is this 1959 or 1960? 1960. 1960, yeah. 1960 okay. Cause I'm, I'm seeing 1959, uh, you guys played, you guys, you lost to uh, St. John's. Yeah, just in, in a regular season game, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the championship way, 1960. Yeah. Um, so, you all American and poverty. And going to, like, the draft, like, can you can speak of, like, um, your senior year and, like, graduating and then going into, like, NBA draft? Yeah, what about Cause it? Uh, I mean, you, I know you highly scouted, and um, just like having to get being drafted by same uh, St. Louis Hawks, you know, going from like New York to Providence to St. Louis. Well, um, I was in my senior year. At, you know, after the season was over, yeah, I was drafted uh, number won by the Hawks. I was the fifth pick or the sixth pick, I can't remember, in the draft. Sixth pick. But, uh, I, yeah, I was selected by the St. Louis Hawks. And uh, I wasn't that excited about it because we had played in St. Louis uh, during my junior year. We played St. Louis University. And I knew what kind of city St. Louis was, so I wasn't that happy about it. But Heck, I was selected, so you know it, that was important in itself. Because yeah, you would draft the 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 draft after Will Chamberlain and Dick Barnett, weren't you? Uh, I, I I think so. I don't remember. I have to go way back and look. <laughs> uh, so, so when you say St. Louis, you know what kind of city St. Louis was. What, what do you mean by that? Well, you couldn't eat in the restaurants downtown. You know, uh, it was somewhat segregated. So that 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 differ from like your experience in New York and by Boston. Oh, oh, definitely. New York wasn't like that at all. I mean, at least we never experienced any of that. Okay, so you play six seasons for the Hawks. Um, Point, played I played, a, played what? You played six seasons right with the Hawks, St. Louis Hawks. Um, I can't. Uh, I um, no, no, I played. Uh, well, actually, I was drafted in '60, and uh, after my first year of pro ball, I had to go on active duty uh, in the military. I was in ROTC in college, so. Uh, I had to go serve my time, and I was a second lieutenant 
in the quartermaster corps in the army. Oh, in the army. Yeah, so I was on active duty for a year and a half. So uh, that I missed that full year with the Hawks. When I got got out of the service, I went back to the Hawks team and uh, played for them until uh, 68, the end of the 68 season. We had a contract problem, and I was traded to Seattle. Okay, um, so I see you drafted. And when you drafted, you drafted uh, around players like Oscar Robertson and Jerry West. um, Right, Oscar and Jerry, yeah. So, like, how how was that draft, like, the draft, the days for the draft, or the draft, and, like, you know, was it, is it, like, how it is now, or was oh, it just... Oh, no, no, yeah. no. It, it wasn't, they, uh, today they fly you in, they have you sitting in the green room and all that kind of stuff, but back then, uh, when I was drafted, uh, I was... Uh, note, I was called to come to the athletic office on campus, and that's when they told me I was drafted by the St. Louis Hawks and okay. that uh, they were going to have a representative come out to see me, you know. So uh, they sent their general manager, a guy named Ed McCauley, to, flew out to the campus to talk to me about signing a contract with the Hawks. Um, so yeah. it wasn't the fanfare that it is today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, unless you know, like in 56, the Hawks drafted Bill Russell. I know you're saying about St. Louis being segregated. I know that they drafted Bill Russell. You know, player coach. Well, they drafted um, Bill Russell and traded him to uh, right. Boston, right? I was just wondering, um, is that like. What's your like? What do you think about them drafting like Bill Russell and training from like uh, Cliff Hagen and Ed McCall? Like, well, that, well, you, you know, I I was still young. I probably knew more about baseball than I did basketball at that time. However, uh, I knew who Bill Russell was because I saw them play in the col. I saw him play in the college all star game at Madison Square Garden. Cause I know that's, just, that's a big. That's, uh, I'm from St. Louis, so when I look at the history and stuff, and I found out St. Louis had drafted Bill Russell and they traded him. So it's like, wow, well, you could have had Bill Russell and like Lenny Wilkins, maybe, you know. Well, they could have, but <laughs> it was unbelievable to me that you'd give up Bill Russell. I mean, this guy was. He was all American in college. He blocked shots. He ran the floor. He, he did everything. And, uh, but. Like I said to you, St. Louis back then was uh, one of those cities where you couldn't eat in the restaurants downtown uh, until uh, 1962, I think it was. Okay, so it was a great change. Um, and playing with the Hawks, did you have, like, I mean, you know you played in the Bob Pettit era. era um, yeah. Like, can you, uh, like, how how was it? How was, like, Bob Pettit as well? Uh, and the rest of the teammates at, like, St. Louis? Well, uh, yeah, some of them, uh, Bob Pettit was friendly, but uh, and Cliff Hagen. The other guys were, they weren't that friendly. And, uh, you know, uh, but I knew one thing. I knew how to get the ball to Bob Pettit. So I didn't worry about what they thought or said, you know. I didn't pay them any mind. And and then, of course, after one year, I, I had to go on active duty. And, you know, so you have to – my frame of mind was a little bit different than a lot of guys uh, at that time. Uh, being an officer in the military, uh, I could care less what they thought because uh, they weren't going to intimidate me. But like I said, you know, uh, Pettit was friendly, and so was Hagen. And and I knew that Pettit, he was the top star on the team. So I knew how to get the ball to him, and I, and I and I knew that, you know, I was going to get my shots, but I also would, you know, make sure he got his. Okay. Um, and McCullough was your coach, right? Uh, no, no, uh, a guy, uh, Harry, Harry. No, uh, I'm sorry, 
Paul Seymour was my first coach. And uh, they fired him when, uh, I guess a year later, because when I got out of the service, they had a, the coach was Harry Gallatin. Okay. So then, I know, like, you say you, say you, you got your um, sent to Seattle. How was um, the St. Louis to Seattle relocation? How was St. Louis compared to Seattle? Or? Yeah, I've I never been personally in Seattle, but um, I know a little about Seattle, but I, I understand, like, okay, it's, it was Western, St. Louis, some of this Midwest city, so. Well, Seattle is a great city, and, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, people were friendlier. Uh, You know, uh, like I said, in St. Louis, I mean, moving – listen, I moved in a neighborhood. I bought a home after I got out of the service, and for sale signs went up everywhere. Uh, But uh, I was not going to be intimidated. And that's who was in St. Louis. And I never had that kind of experience in Seattle. Or New York. Yeah. Or New York. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's home. It's home. It's home. Yeah, not to be. Not to be. All right, so yeah. Listen, I'm going to have to go because I have yeah. to go out with my wife somewhere. Okay, I was, yeah, I was going to get 28 minutes in. Um, so what time are you available Wednesday? So I can, like, um, how about, uh, yeah, uh, how, how about 11 o'clock? Pacific time? Uh, Seattle time. Yeah, 11 o'clock. All right. All right. Yeah, I can call back uh, on Wednesday at 11 o'clock. Okay, great. All right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. Um, have a good day. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Yeah, I was just I was just looking for um, some input on like John Thompson, or, like um, you know, in, in references like his, like him as a coach, and like also I guess I don't, I don't you didn't you didn't play with him, did you? Who is this? John Thompson Senior. Oh, John, John Thompson. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I didn't play with him. I know, I know, I knew John real well. Yeah. Uh, but I no, I never played with him. I had already graduated when he was at Providence. Okay. Um. You know, can you just um get some input on like him as a coach? I'm not. He's, I'm not I think he was, like was the first black coach to like you know win the NBA championship, and you know, it was just well, big. John was John was a great guy. I mean, you know, he was uh, a a great human being. I mean, he he understood the game. He was a student of the game, and uh, and I thought he was a very fine coach. Uh, you know, and uh, we we had some friends in common, and. Uh, so I had great respect for John. Okay, and you, you you never coached on the college level, did you? No, I didn't. No, um, no, I uh, I was a uh, you know in the NBA. Uh, I became a player coach and then went into full time coaching right, at the um, pro is level. It, is there any reason why you uh, never like uh, coached in the college? Well, I, I was just uh, – I, w- I had an opportunity. I was exposed to pro coaching. I was a player coach. Mm. And so when I retired, uh, the opportunity was there, and I went right to it. Mm. And the opportunity just – it was um, opened up by a franchise by, um, by Seattle franchise, wasn't it? Yes, it was the Seattle franchise was the first place I coached. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, is there any like um, like um, any input you have versus like amateur and professional, like basketball, in terms of like you know, just something you notice in your career, like the level of competition, or just like you know, some with the system of getting paid versus not getting paid? Because I'm pretty, I'm, I'm aware. I mean, you're pretty aware that um, I think in like another two or three years, college athletes to be paid in this some like some kind of system or add on to their stipends. Scholarship. Um, uh, can you hold on one second? I have somebody call it on the house phone. Hold on one second. Right. Hello.
Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying, uh, can you speak on, like, the difference between amateur, kind of like the, the thin line between amateur and professional? Because um, it, it's, um, in a few years, uh, NCAA athletes will be um, paid in, this, in a way, you know, besides this. Well, that's something, yeah, I, I don't really have an opinion on that. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, when I went to college, uh, I mean, we got a scholarship and, uh, I wouldn't have been able to afford to go if I hadn't had a scholarship. So that, you know, uh, in essence, took care of my college. Uh, so at the time, we were pretty satisfied with that. It's a different world today. And so, you know, um, guys are being exposed to different things, and they uh, feel that they should get paid for that now. Uh, to me... Uh, you know, maybe there's a, a good way of going about it, whether they set up a fund for them or whatever, and if they stay in school two, three, four years, they receive a fund based on that. Uh, I think you need to give some thought to it, but it, it's worth uh, talking about. Okay. Um, can you, I know you said you say you graduated from Providence, Ken, so can you kind of like speak on um, – I know it's why – and then you, I guess you didn't come up in a one and done, like two and done era. So you, most people say it in college, you know, to junior, senior year. So can you like kind of um, add on about like, you know, how, how that four year experience like help you develop as a person? Um, well, the four years were great for me at Providence. Providence was an excellent school. We had some great teachers uh, during the time that I was in school, uh, mostly were Dominican fathers who taught, although we did have lay teachers as well. Uh, and uh, at that time, ROTC was mandatory the first two years. So I was in ROTC, and I went to advance ROTC because I felt like when I graduated, if I was going to have to go into service, I wanted to go in as an officer. So I took advanced ROTC. And so when I graduated... Uh, I not only had my degree, but I was a second lieutenant in the quartermaster corps in the army. Okay. Um, you, um, I mean, I, I, I listened to uh, a recent interview with you, and you, you're talking about on um, the presidency at this point, and like you know, kind of like you know, um, the bigotry that the president um, presents. Um, can you can you speak on like kind of like the bigotry? that you might have seen or, like, experienced in, like, military or just basketball as a whole? I mean, you're, like, you're one of the only, uh, like, like, a top black Well, player, I, uh, you know, I saw more bigotry when I was out of the service. I mean, I didn't uh, experience a lot in the service. Uh, but, um, I mean, we were, uh, when I was in the service, it was more about representing the country that we live in. Yeah. And, uh you know, uh, I don't like what's happening today. Um, I'm, uh, I feel that uh, it's really important to bring in, uh, attention to injustices that, you know, because black lives do matter. And when black lives matter, all lives matter. But I'm not for uh, destroying property or vandalizing stuff. I'm not for that but I am for bringing attention to Black Lives Matter. I think that what we need to do is have conversation. We need to talk about how do we make it better? Not, you know, destroying things, but how do we make the police department better? You know, uh, we got to make uh, politicians accountable. And so everybody has to vote. Uh, we got to vote at the... Uh, you know, uh, for your mayor, for your governor, your city council member. Uh, it has to be on every level. We've got to take part in what is happening in society and let them know how we feel. So we need to have those kind of talks and, mm -hmm. and, and, and find out how do we make it better. You know, I mean, I don't think that uh, in this day and age you could say, oh, we can't have a police department. No, no, no. No, but we got to have a better one. And so how do we make it better? You know, those are the questions that should be asked. Mm. So, um, like, so in the sports, there's, um, 
I mean, you 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 think it's like the advancement of like coaching, like back coaching. That's something like it's a problem today, where it's like you. I'm not sure you heard the Rooney Rule. The what rule? The Rooney Rule. It's um, it's kind of like an NFL rule where so many black coaches have to come in to interview when a position is um, if a head coach or the coaching position is up, where it's um, it's kind of been implemented by other um. Sports organizations. Um, I mean, you, you kind of touched upon this, but how, how do you? What, how, what's your input on that? Seeing as like um, you got you got that opportunity before there was even a Rooney Rule. And, yeah, and well, you, when I got the opportunity, I wanted to show them that all we needed was an opportunity. We didn't need anybody to give us anything. We uh-huh. just want to show that we can think, we can make decisions, okay? Uh, we know how to work with people. So, uh, you know, all, all we want is an opportunity. Hmm. And um, just speaking on the player coach position, um, why, do you, why do you think it's um, player coach or something that's um, it's kind of been like um, kind of taken out the game? Cause I know a lot of people wonder, like, you know, you, it was at one point a lot of greats were, you know, player coaches, but now – um, it's not that dynamic anymore, and like, or mostly well, like it's player. too hard now. It's it's mm-hmm. too difficult now because uh, you got to spend a lot of time teaching, explaining, showing, because athletes come out of school after one year. Uh, when I was in college, we we had to do four years. Uh, today, kids come out after one year or two years, so there is much they still have to learn. So a coach has to be able to teach, to explain, to show. And uh, so I think it, it makes it tougher to be a player coach today. I don't think you could do it today and do justice to both. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm not sure, like, um, this is something that's, like, prevalent when you are uh, playing and coaching, but um, I, I know, like, the, like, the pay was totally different. So a lot of times you see players um, have like uh, second jobs for the summer and stuff. Was that, um, mm-hmm. was that something? Was that something that you um, that you that you were part of? Like you had to have another job and stuff. It wasn't just basketball. Like you know, you had other focuses. No, no, no. Once I became a player coach, no, I I had one job. I I was, you know, I made sure that they were going to pay me enough, or else I wouldn't okay. do it. Okay. All right. Um. Uh, um, just like uh, talking about the game. Uh, you're gonna stuff. have to hold. You're gonna have to hold on again. Hold, okay. All right, that's fine. All right. My phone keeps ringing. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Hey, Jen. My daughter. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> this, my phone just, you know, everybody calls because, uh, you know, they know I'm home <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, with the pandemic. Um, but go ahead. Okay. Um. So I know something like I played basketball in high school, and um, I noticed that, um, like, it's not a, like a rule for the like high school basketball to have a shot clock. I'm not sure if you had a shot clock back then, um, but I mean, you close in the shot clock era, so. Like, do you what? What's your input on um, the lack of like shot clocks in like the high school game versus like collegiate game and NBA, where it's like you know speeds, are, you know, it's a different mindset of thinking. You know, once the shot clock is introduced, and it's something a lot of people, a lot of fans, and like you know, as, uh, basketball players, coaches, and players, um, kind of want, but you just don't see it on that level. Well, no, I I don't think it would hurt. I mean, uh, the game of basketball is a great game, and I think that uh, athletes would adjust to it. So I, I don't, I don't have a, uh, uh, a say about it one way or the other. But I don't think it would hurt if they decided that they wanted to have a shot clock. Uh, I don't think it'll take away from the game. Okay. Um, and it's like it's more like a personal question because um, I, I forget um, I was gonna look it up on um, you, you, you. 
played with Lee Winfield, correct? Oh yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay, so Lee Winfield um happened to be my neighbor. Um, oh, and, um, great guy, great. Lee was uh was just outstanding. Yes. Uh, so I was, I was just trying to like get some input on Lee Winfield because he was also a player coach. Well, not not NBA, but just like you know, he later on coached. Um, you just right, he later on coached at St. Louis University, right? Yeah, in Mizzou. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he uh, he he played for me. I I was uh, the player coach at the Seattle SuperSonics, and Lee was on the team, and we had an excellent team. And he was certainly uh, uh, the the time that I stayed here, he he was excellent, and. Uh, and of course, later on, uh, they wanted me to play our coach, and uh, and I wound up being traded. So uh, because I, at the time, I decided I'd keep coaching because they uh, I'd keep playing rather because they didn't pay coaches the kind of money they should. And so I was going to keep playing, and that's when I got traded. Yeah. Um. Okay, so um, can you can you just how you kind of speak on like um your overall like you know your career as a player and then your career as a coach in the NBA and like things that you know. Um, well, well, Lee was very athletic, you know, and he he had great quickness. Uh, uh, I thought he was an outstanding player. Now I didn't see him as a coach, uh, you know, because he coached. I wasn't following the college game at the time because you know being way out here and he was back in St. Louis. But, uh, but you know, certainly uh, I'm sure he did an excellent job because I knew he knew the game. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, so, then, uh, could you, could I, I, I read, I'm not sure if it's true, but I heard, I mean, your foundation is, um, did you, like, abolish it or is it just, like, you kind of... No, I down? didn't abolish it. Uh, I just... We stopped doing the dinner, um, and but we had no idea the coronavirus was coming, so it would have been stopped anyway. But uh, but I still uh, try to raise funds for the clinic. Uh, I have a friend of mine who I was able the company he works for they gave uh, fifty thousand dollars to the clinic, and the clinic. Uh, it, it's, it's, it provides health care and education and to families, uh, even though they can't afford to pay, they still get the service free. Mm. Okay. I got the phone again. I'm sorry. Oh, no, sorry. Hello. Uh, the 16th between 10 and 2. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so back, back to the foundation. Cause, I mean, um, I, I, I grew up kind of like watching, I'm not even, like, I didn't see all of them, but I remember like, you know, your videotapes of like coaching and like how to play and stuff. So is that part of like mm-hmm. um, found the foundation like also uh, – the funding go to like creating a video yes. space of one on one. Well, oh, well, I did a lot of things to help raise funds for the clinic. Uh, mm. I I feel that when you have an opportunity to give back to your community, if you can, uh, it would be a great thing to do. And I had met people who who ran the clinic. They provided health care and education to low-income families, and uh, I just thought it was something that I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, so it, it was uh, a way for me to give back. Mm. Um, and, like, um, I know you grew up in Brooklyn, in New York, so, like, you know, kind of like, and the last thing for you to that you coach for was a uh, Knicks, uh, can you uh, kind of talk about, like, reasons why you stopped coaching and then how was that experience um, growing? I mean, coaching for the city um, that you grew up in, and the team. You kind of, are you a Knicks fan? 
Well, uh, my experience with the Knicks wasn't very great. Uh, I, I didn't stay but a year because they they had too much to say. I, I just didn't like the way the operation was run, so I left. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, I... Uh, you know, I wanted to spend more time at home. So, uh, you know, I had played and I had coached and I traveled a lot making appearances and stuff like that. So I, I just thought it was a, a good time to step back and spend more time with my family. Okay. Um, was, that, was that the same kind of um, feeling that you had with the Hawks? I mean, I know you coached longer for the Hawks, but just going back to coach for the franchise that drafted you and uh... – What's that? Uh, um, I, I was trying to ask, how, well, how was the experience with, like, coaching for the Hawks? I mean, it's the team that drafts, the franchise that drafted you. Oh, you know, you yeah. Play. Well, it was it was fun. I had a great experience there. It was, uh, um, you know, I, I think I was with the Hawks for six or seven years. And, uh, you know, uh, we had a good team and we were competitive. And uh, so while I was there, I enjoyed it. Okay, um, and then like you know, coaching for like the um, USA team and stuff like that. How how was well that, that was that was a great experience because you're, you're coaching the world's best players, and and we wanted to show the world that we were that good. And so uh, in '92, I was the assistant coach to Chuck Daly, and then in '96, I was the head coach of the Dream Team. So it was two great experiences uh, to, uh, you know, play against the, the world's best players. And uh, certainly uh, uh, we felt that the U.S. had the best talent, and I think we proved that. Okay. Uh, you know, back to, like, how you're saying um, you, you kind of you retired to be close with your family. Can you kind of speak on um, how, like, I mean, you, told, you spoke on, like, um, your childhood how like what I think I read you um you married in like the sixties? Um, well, we we've been married a long time. Uh-huh. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, we uh you know I think we got married in sixty two. Oh, sixty two. Um, so can you can you kind of talk about how you met your wife and um uh, how that kind of like, well that know? that's just we 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 met in in college. Uh, we oh, started no. dating. Uh, after my first year of pro ball, we started to date, and uh, and a couple of years later, we decided to get married. Okay, so your, so your wife attended Providence as well? No, no. She uh, went to uh, uh, Hunter College in New York. Okay. So you guys just married, like, um, around college area, and then you got married? Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, can, you, can you speak on that? Cause, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure you've heard of basketball-wise. I I did what basketball wise? No, no, Sam. I'm pretty sure you, um, you heard like the TV show basketball wise, or the kind of shows. Um, oh, like, oh, um, that's yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't watch. I don't watch that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, can I just wonder if you like uh, speak on like how um, your experience of like being married and how like, how that gave you a foundation and you know support you know that um you know. Well, guess, my wife like, is very supportive. Uh, you know, I mean, we have three great kids and they're young adults. And they're doing well. They have their own families, and uh, we're very proud of them. Okay. Uh, and uh, oh, oh, so you, you say you don't watch basketball, wise, so no, ask you any questions about that. No, I don't Actually. watch that. Okay. Um, well, now I know you said uh, your recruiting process was um, somewhat like you know, uh, kind of helped by the father of your church. So um, I know, like, recruiting is something a lot of athletes have trouble with. And I was wondering, could you kind of just give, like, some tips on, like, for, like um, high school players to somewhat, like, you know, that help, like, you know, the best things to do to get recruited, in your opinion? So Well, you know, you I, I, to... to me is, is if you want to have a great uh, – an opportunity to be recruited, uh, I mean, the thing is, is that you want to be as good as you can be, and and so you have to work at it. And and one of the things, uh, if you want to become a, a a real good basketball player, your ball handling skills need to be very good. 
because that allows you to get to wherever you want to get to on the floor. It allows you to make the plays you need to make, okay, to take advantage of your teammates. So mm -hmm. to me, uh, the ball handling skills, uh, if, you, if you're if you good at that and then you work on your shooting, uh, certainly, uh, you know, you can improve in all the rest of it. But but you got to come ready to play uh, every night, and you got to hear what your coach is saying. As you say, they have a good relationship, relationship with your coach that helps in the ball right. handling. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, sound like one of the last questions. Um, so I mean, you coached in Atlanta. Uh, you got you got drafted by St. Louis Hawks, which you kind of, which you said is uh, it was like some of the first experience of racism, and then you came back to coach in Atlanta, which is somewhat like you know a progressive city for black politicians. Mm -hmm. Um, how was your experience uh, coaching? Not coaching, was just like being like a, uh, I guess a history maker in Atlanta. Just you know, in the time well, of the nineties. Well, it, it gave me an opportunity to meet a lot of people. Uh, I got mm -hmm. to meet Andy Young, John Lewis, Maynard Jackson. Uh, I got to meet a lot of people. And I thought it was fantastic because these are icons. These were people who had a lot to say about the history of black Americans. And so for me, it was a great time, and and I enjoyed being there. Um, so is there any, like, um, like, um, kind of like stories or, like, any uh, just, like, I guess stories in the no, sense that like, I don't, I don't have I don't have any stories I don't have any stories I just got to, to meet a lot of people. <laughs> okay, so um, well then yeah, can we talk about like, just like like the community outreach and you know, like how like you said you you were around a lot of people that were iconic um, and how like you know you kind of do you, like do you feel like um, as for like Atlanta being a progressive city for like black politicians and black people do you you think um, there's a certain like a level of outreach that was just like certainly um kind of like bestowed on you or you might have seen in other cities well no i you know i grew up in brooklyn new york and uh, and i met people there too uh mm -hmm. i i met one of the first uh black congresswoman uh gal by the name of shirley chisholm uh was from my neighborhood so you know we you you get an opportunity sports provided an opportunity to meet a lot of people I've been able to travel the world. I, I got to meet Nelson Mandela, you know. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's uh, – you get a chance to meet these people. You see what they're doing and, and how they carry themselves and how they affected history, and it, and it was a wonderful experience. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's, that's it. Uh, so – I think uh, I think that kind of answers all the questions I have. So I'm, I'm gonna begin to like start typing this, and uh, if um, I have any questions, I'll be sure to reach out to you to fill it out. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Um, any like last remarks you have? Just um. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, I forgot. Okay, so um, like right now it's a bubble system, and a lot of NBA teams are like. Uh, I mean, yeah. Can you just, can you speak on some of like the racial? Um, resistance we're seeing nowadays, where like I know in the NBA they have like people that um, jerseys like including like um, causes and stuff, and in the sports world as a whole, it's somewhat you know kind of a resistance to go back and play. Um, well, they discussed it. I thought the players the, they discussed it, they talked about it, and uh, and they. Uh, decided to go back, which I uh, applaud them for doing, because every time you see a game on TV, you see on the floor there, it says Black Lives Matter. And mm -hmm. and so they want the world to know that they're paying attention, that we can be better as a country. And and like I said, it's important to vote. And, and a lot of them are getting their franchises to make the place where they play available for people to vote. So they are doing something, and I think it's uh, that they will continue to do something, and I think that's good. Okay. Um, and I mean, I think um, in, in this way, 
there's been like uh like I saw an article just talking about Bill Russell walked out on games, um walked out of the game, I think was some kind of <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a coffee shop. He he left. He he wouldn't play the game in that. It was a exhibition game that was going to be played in Kentucky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so, like, can you uh, do you, do you have any experience where you kind of kind of protested? You know, just the mistreatment. I know you came up in like Vietnam, and you know. No, no, right no. There. I uh, not no, no. I I was at the the ninety. Uh, the 62, 1962 uh, All-Star game when we were all in Boston and we went into one locker room uh, we, because we wanted to get a pension plan. And uh, until they agreed, we were not going to play the game. And so CBS uh, said to us that uh, if if the team wasn't out, if both teams weren't out on the floor in 20 minutes, they would have to go with another program. So the NBA acquiesced and gave us a, a promise that we would have a pension plan by June, and we did. And so that was the one protest, and I was there for that one. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I, I, I don't know about that. So that's, that's the 